Hey guys, I'm here at Illuma with my friend Allie Waddell. Hello. She's gonna tell us all about ketamine today, but first I thought it'd be really cool if we could see the clinic. Yes. Can you take let's us for a little it. tour. Let's do it. Let's all do right. it. Come on. Welcome. Austin, Texas. Follow us. <laughs> COVID updates. Very exciting here. Turn on the light. Normally we don't have the light on because it's a little more moody, but this is our waiting room. Welcome to Illuma. You would come in, relax, hang out, settle down, um, have some books for you to peruse, some coffee for your loved ones. <laughs> this is our uh, front desk area, which I'm at right now. Um, and then that's a restroom. And then this is what we call an infusion room. So this is where you would come in um, and get your infusion. You get to sit in this really comfy recliner, put your feet up. And then um, you're fully monitored the whole time. So it's an IV, so we do IV ketamine. Uh, there's a few different ways that you can administer, but we do IV. And in that chair over there will be our infusionist, who's a trained paramedic. So you're fully monitored the whole time, which makes it like uber, uber safe. It's literally like the safest hour of your life because there's a paramedic like in the room with you and you just sit back. You can enjoy uh, a relaxing video, but for most people we say to really try to stay internal, we'll give you an eye mask and you'll come in and it's basically an hour of self care and healing. Um, the infusion r lasts roughly 60 minutes. You're in and out in about 90 minutes. And then after your infusion, you'll get up and we'll kind of guide you in here most people need to go to the bathroom and then we'll guide you into our one of our recovery rooms this is one of them and you can hang out in here for as long as you need um, people also use this as a meditation room before if they want to kind of take some extra time we have weighted blankets we have aromatherapy um, and so we also offer some ketamine assisted psychotherapy. So if your therapist comes, y'all can also process in here afterwards. So there's a few different options. So again, you're in and out in roughly 90 minutes. Most people come in for a series of six treatments over about four to six weeks. Awesome. So that's it. All right, let's it's dig in. Simple. Let's dig yeah. into some Where ketamine wanna... on the actual podcast. All right, so we're gonna talk some ketamine now with Allie. So again, we're in her cute entryway of Illuma here in Austin. So um, yeah, when I first met you, you were not running this clinic. When did it, when did it open? I was not running this clinic. So we've been open for about 19 months. Yeah. So we actually opened on my 40th birthday. Really? Yes, which was February of 2019. Okay. So we've been open, you know, a little bit. Yeah. And so, okay, so for, the listener who has no idea what a ketamine clinic is, let's start there. Which is most people. <laughs> Which is yeah. the vast majority of people. So ketamine, um, a ketamine clinic is basically an alternative mental health clinic. So ketamine is an anesthesia. It was developed um, during Vietnam. It was called the buddy drug. So it was the first, an it was an anesthesia to rival um, basically opioids. Mm -hmm. Because what was happening is on the battlefield, they were giving guys morphine for pain, but they were overdosing them. So they were killing soldiers on the battlefield because they were trying to help them for pain. So they were mm -hmm. trying to figure out an anesthesia that would be easy to administer in a battlefield that wasn't gonna suppress somebody's respiration or their heart rate, which is what opioids do. Mm. Um, and so they came up with ketamine. They actually first came up with PCP, mm. which was the first thing that they discovered. Wow. But then people were having cra <laughs> crazy <laughs> things happen. And so they went in and basically m you know, manipulated the molecule and then ketamine mm. was developed. Wow. So it's been used for now decades, you know, close to close to 50 years, it's been used consistently as an anesthesia. It's the most widely used anesthesia in the world um, because it's super safe. Again, because it doesn't suppress your breathing, it doesn't suppress your heart rate. And so that's why it's used a lot with animals. It's used a lot with children because you don't have to do what's called intubation or you don't have to put a breathing tube in people when you give them large doses of ketamine for pain or for surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then, interestingly, uh, the first kind of inkling that it did something with mental health, because of course that makes no sense. Okay, so how did we get to, <laughs> yeah. to mental health? Right. Is they were treating soldiers who were getting massive burns with ketamine, and they were also treating them with morphine. 
Well, for some reason, all of a sudden, the soldiers that were getting treated with ketamine didn't have PTSD. Wow. And weren't having these, like, huge trauma issues mm. post. And so they went back and they were like, wait, 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 what? Something significant is happening right now. Why are all these soldiers suffering and these aren't? And oh. they went back and looked and that's mm, what they that. looked at. So that was... I think roughly about 20 years ago was kind of that first kind of aha, let's kind of look into wow. this. And so since then, it's been steadily just kind of very slowly increasing. And then in the last probably three, three to four years, there's been a significant upturn. And I think, you know, one thing is the word kind of got out Two, we're at a, med a mental health complete crisis and everybody's just looking for answers. Mm -hmm. um, the government's looking for answers. Fine. I mean, there's like a lot of kind of back of like, okay, something majorly is going wrong. Our tools that we've had up until now are not working for a lot of people. We need to start looking. So ketamines kind of rise to the top and then the psychedelic wave has started and it's not a traditional psychedelic, but it still is, and it's considered a psychedelic or a psycho, you know, psychotropic factors kind of within it. Yeah. And so it kind of hit all those things at once, and now it's gaining mass popularity. Um, and so people are seeing, you know, there's about 300 clinics nationally now. So wow. most major cities have at least one. Denver has 40 ketamine clinics. Wow. <laughs> It makes sense. <laughs> so um, it kind of goes along with states that have legalized um, marijuana. So California, of course, has a lot. And that, I think, is just like open-minded population, kind of that kind of mm -hmm. route. Um, and so ketamine is now used to uh, treat. The main, main things are anxiety, depression, PTSD, but then it works really well on anything that has a rumination loop in it. Hmm. Really amazing on OCD really amazing on eating disorders, which is something very hard to deal with mm -hmm. for most people. That is like a lifelong thing. So anything where you can't really get out of the loop, yeah. like you just kind of get stuck, it's amazing at, at dealing with those and really helping people um, to break those patterns. And we can talk about like what's happening in the brain. Yeah, why let's go there. Happening. That's exactly where my mind was going. Can you explain that? Yeah. Um, interestingly, in fMRIs, actually the brain activity looks very similar to the brain activity in psilocybin. Hmm. So it works on a different receptor. It works on your GABA receptor. Um, but what it does is it basically turns all your neural pathways back on. And if you know anything about how kind of the brain works is over time, you know, what wires together, what fires together, wires together. So over time, your patterns become ingrained literally in your brain. Yep. <laughs> so it just, and so that's why you think like, I don't want to do this, but why do I keep doing it? And why is it so hard for me to change those? And it's literally your brain is being wired to be efficient. And so it rethinks mm. the things that you like to think about a lot, even if those things are completely not helpful. <laughs> right. And so what ketamine allows you to do is it turns your neuro all your uh, kind of neuroplasticity back on. And at the same time, which is a really cool new thing that they found out about 18 months ago, was it floods your brain with BDNF or brain derived neuro growth factor. So that's why people see lasting transformation. So we're doing them in the series. So we're trying to turn those neural pathways back on, bathe your, bathe your brain in growth factor so that mm -hmm. those neuro pathways can stay on. And then you're doing integration work in between your sessions. So now that you can build your life into those new pathways, right. because again, it's a tool, it's a tool like anything else. It does not work in a bubble. <laughs> this is not magic. Right. Like there's nothing that's gonna fix you. You're not gonna come in and get a shot or an infusion and you're gonna be fixed and your depression's gone and you're never gonna have to worry about it again. If you go back into your life that sucked and you were eating crappy yeah. and you weren't taking care of yourself and you have shitty relationships and you're not sleeping, guess what? Doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Like it's not going to fix anything. It's creating an opportunity space for it to work now when you do yes. that work. It's creating more plasticity, literally, yeah. instead of this hard, rigid pathway that you're like, somebody's telling you to change and you're like, I can understand what you're saying, but I can't actually do it. And exactly. you're saying this is a helpful tool and making it more possible to actually be able to do it. But if you don't do the work, you just go back in your old patterns. Exactly. Yeah. And it's one of those things like 
the other thing is when you're struggling really bad, you know, and you're in crisis mode, you have very little energy yeah. and ability to make the fundamental changes totally. that you need to. That's totally. why it's really hard. And, you know, I've been in wellness for 20 plus years now. We have to be very mindful of speaking down to people that are struggling because it sounds really easy. Like, just take care of yourself. Like, why mm -hmm. aren't you taking care mm -hmm. of yourself? Mm -hmm. But when you when you realize that when you're in crisis, you have very little energy to make those changes. So even right. telling somebody, why can't you just go for a walk? <laughs> it does feel impossible yeah. when you're really struggling. Yeah. And so this gives people the space in order to then uh, hopefully elicit those changes Beautiful. with some additional support. Yeah, I love that. I was actually just having a conversation with a friend about that, about how actually some of this and when you're already doing everything in your power and we're talking mindset or we're talking these different things and they're like, it's, it can be a shame point um, oh, for people. Cause they're like, yeah, I really want to do that. Like all that stuff you're saying sounds really great. And sometimes I think people can feel when they are dealing with actual depression and it's this severe, they're like shaming themselves for not being able to get there oh, right it's a huge <laughs> loop because you know what you're supposed to be doing so then you're like now i'm not only feeling guilty that i feel like crap all the time now i'm feeling guilty because i know i'm supposed to be doing that right I'm still not doing that right. why am i t am i just broken is there something wrong with me why can other people do it and yeah. i can't do it right and so that's a huge thing at aluma that we've really you know, it's something that we want to bust up. We really want to change the mental health model. And one of those models that is just really bad is this top-down doctor <laughs> approach to mm. medicine mm. and to especially to mental health where it's like, I'm the psychiatrist and you're the broken person and wow. I'm the fixed person and wow. I know what's good for you. <laughs> and it just is not helpful for people. It makes people feel shame. Right. And it's like, instead, we need to meet people where they are from a really empathetic place. And one of the reasons that you know we our clinic is different is I've struggled with major depression and suicidal ideation and anxiety most of my life and my partner who's my partner in the clinic and my partner in life dr. Ken he's had major anxiety disorder his entire life wow. you know and cool. so we really mm -hmm. come from it from a place of like knowing like, yeah like it's no joke and like we're gonna just we're, this is a tool that we found. We're going to share our resources with you. We're the same as you. We're not different. Come here and we'll we'll figure out what will work for you. And that's the other thing. Not everything works for everybody. And like that cookie cutter approach to, mm -hmm. you know, anything is not the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody's so different. And so it's figuring that out. I love that you guys are coming at this from a place of total empathy. So when you're saying like, no, we really have empathy, you're like, no, we really do. <laughs> because yeah. we struggle ourselves. And I, I guess my next question is um, a friend who I was talking to about academy, and I've had several friends that do this, that deal with suicidal thoughts. And like, what's typical for like the benefit? Because some have said like a couple weeks, some have mm -hmm. said longer, like what what do you, what have you found in practicality is like the, you know, how long it lasts before people tend to feel the need to come back for another treatment? Yeah, that's a super hard question because okay. it, people, we have such a wide range of severity of patients. Okay. So we have very severe people that are coming literally out of the hospital off suicide watch and mm -hmm. are in their teens. And then we have mm -hmm. people in their 70s. And then we have highly successful people that are looking for creative exploration. Oh, and then, wow. So we have this like very uh -huh. wide range. But I'll say like if you took kind of the you know, the bell-shaped curve middle of our population, which is somebody who's been struggling for n probably at least a year or a number of years. You know, it's been kind of this thing mm -hmm. and it's probably gotten worse and they've just kind of hit a point where they're like, I gotta do mm -hmm. something, nothing I'm doing is working. Um, so they would typically come in for the series of six infusions over four to six weeks. I would say most people feel a shift around infusion three, which is about mm -hmm. a week, week and a half in. Mm -hmm. um, some people a little longer, say four to five. Some people, it's the first one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, some people, there's a percentage that, you know, again, bell-shaped curve. Yeah. Some people, it's nine. You know, some mm -hmm. people we do the six and they're like, I'm just mm -hmm. not there and we add on to the end. Those tend to be people who have been suffering for a lot longer and tend to be on a lot of medications. Okay. And the reason that is, is those medications put a little bit of a control box on your emotional range. And the mm -hmm. thing that ketamine is really good at 
is allowing you to feel, and that's why it's different than most mental health medications, it doesn't dampen your emotional center, it actually expands your emotional hmm. center, because what it's trying to do is allow you to feel your suppressed emotions so that you can process them so that they no longer are triggering. So it's very similar to EMDR in that way, where you can kind of really get down to the root cause. And again, that's what makes it different, is I really view it as an empowerment medication because it allows you to take a really good and hard look at like why you're actually suffering mm. and the big aha that most people get in that chair is at first very sad and very scary which is I am the crux of my suffering but with that is I am my savior and nothing's gonna fix me except myself. And so it's this empowerment thing Beautiful. of going like, if I'm the one that put myself here, which can be devastating if you've been suffering for decades, mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's a really hard realization of being like, oh sh shit, mm -hmm. <laughs> I did this mm -hmm. to myself. Um, and not to say that trauma, you know, I'm not saying that the mm -hmm. trauma didn't happen and there weren't mm -hmm. reasons why people are suffering. I'm saying that at some point you have to take full responsibility for your wellness mm -hmm. and really empower yourself to be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to really take charge and do all I can to make it better. Yeah. I've had many, um, people on this podcast say the same thing. Um, I actually just had an interview with a lady who she had MS at 19 and mm -hmm. somebody came to her and said, like, so what do you think you did to get the MS? And she was so mad, right? She was like, I'm a victim. Um, like, how dare you insinuate that I have any sort of fault in this thing? And she said it was the greatest gift anyone ever gave her because it actually did get her thinking proactively of like, well, what? I don't know. Like, wait, does that mean I can actually do something about yeah. this? Like, hmm. You know, so it's like, it's like, it's not your fault, but getting into the shift of like, self-responsibility in a way that lets you know that you have options yes. in that kind of self-responsibility of yes. like, wait, I can actually like try some things and experiment here and see what helps and what doesn't and, 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 and explore it and adventure in it <laughs> a little yeah, bit is exactly. kind of liberating in a way instead of just being like, I just have this thing and there's nothing I can do when I just have to sit with it and it sucks, you know? Yeah. So. And that's where people get with Western <clears throat> mental health, right? you know, is you go to a psychiatrist, they tell you your brain's broken, they tell you, you know, mm -hmm. your, your, Just deal neuro, with it. your neurotransmitters aren't working and the only way to do this is for you to take this pill and even though this pill makes you feel worse, I'm sorry, this is, and then we'll switch you. And yeah. then that's really, when that happens for decades, you can see why people get in here and like the biggest thing we give people is a sense of hope. Mm -hmm. It's like, what if it could be completely different, mm -hmm. you know? And I say, I just need the door like mm -hmm. cracked. cracked. Like you mm -hmm. don't have to fully believe that it's possible that your life could be different, but I need you to just say that there's, there's a possibility that it's there yeah. and that hopefully this will help open that door more. And I'm telling you, I cry <laughs> with patients all the time that they wake up a different person. You know, mm -hmm. like it's like, I did not know that this was possible. Oh. I didn't know I could feel this. I haven't, I forgot that happiness was an option. Wow. I didn't realize that mm. I could be happy, that I didn't have to mm. worry, that I wasn't afraid I was gonna kill myself all every day and leave my kids. It, you know, like it's mm -hmm. just, you know, or parents saying you gave me my kid back and I thought I'd lost her. Wow. You know, and it's that's huge. It's that's huge. And it works for most people. You know, that's the thing. Yeah. The great thing about ketamine is there's basically zero side effects. It works very quickly and it works for most people. And if it doesn't work, there's zero side effects. So it really is one right. of those things where it's like, <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of drawback. Like yeah. there's not, nothing's going to happen to you if right. you try it, you know, yeah. but well over 80% of our patients see a significant reduction in their symptoms within a month. I mean, That's nothing amazing. else can hold a candle to that. And suicidal ideation is through the roof. It's over 92% within one hour, it's out of your system. Wow. And, it, and that lasts 24 to 48 hours, but it'll get you out of the crisis. So as somebody who struggled with suicidal, suicidality, um, that feels like a miracle. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. I, first, I was just, you know, thinking recently, like, how new we are in mental health, like, how truly, like, oh, yeah. it's like, <laughs> and when, we still really don't have any, we're, we're just learning, <laughs> it's like, literally, like, as human beings, we are just learning how much mental health 
is an issue, first of all, because it's been such a shame point for yeah. so long. It's oh. like everyone would just drink themselves into oblivion or be sad or become recluses or whatever. And it's mm -hmm. like now we're finally talking about it and we're finally like <clears throat> seeing the reality of what it is because people say it's an epidemic and I'm kind of like is it an epidemic or are we just actually talking about it now because when I, oh, yeah. when I look back at like old 1800s pictures I'm like those people ain't looking too happy you know like I don't know I think maybe human beings yeah. have struggled with this for a long time and so I just um, want to give you guys like like say thank you for mm -hmm. having the follow through to create a place like this to help people be able to have solutions you know because yeah. I have friends that have had just it's honestly literally saved their lives being able to go do ketamine like you said because it's mm -hmm. such an acute um thing that it, and it has lasting effects at least for them it lasts for a, 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 at least a few yeah. weeks you know yeah, so sure. so good on you okay i'm gonna ask you like the hardest question yeah, let's do it <laughs> this is the hardest question can you try to explain the experience at all oh yes of course <laughs> hold on i told you it was hard ready <laughs> and go no um okay well interestingly i'll kind of explain a few things um so you do this series of six infusions uh we slowly for most patients increase their dose over time so your experience will s will change slightly depending on dosage so the first infusion that you come in is based on your weight it's a relatively low dose we call it shaking hands with the drug it's just kind of getting you used to how the process is going because most people are very anxious when they come in the first sure. time they have no idea what's about to happen especially if they have no altered state yeah. history which is a pretty big percentage of our population um and so they've never been in an altered state besides maybe being drunk and so it's mm -hmm. a it's a different deal mm -hmm. <laughs> versus somebody who's had psychedelic experience you know there's a different thing um and so it's a relatively low dose that first infusion most people feel kind of this mix of very heaviness because again it's a you know it's an anesthesia so it's mm -hmm. kind of making your body go to sleep and then at the same time kind of a floaty feeling so you just kind of feel like really sinky and then kind of floaty and uh, most people that first infusion is super positive it's a lot of like sense of gratitude remember of connection probably people come up some people depending on when they're coming in and what they're working through maybe some emotions come up maybe they have some crying or some grief around some stuff um, and so that one is probably, you know, for most people, pretty easy breezy. As we increase the dose, what we're looking for with most patients um, is the dissociative experience. So that's actually you leaving your body. Um, some people used to call it the K-hole. They still call it that um, in the drug circles. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little different than that. Um, even if you've done ketamine in a recreational um, setting, IV is like a completely different thing. We have many people that have come in and said, oh, I've done it. And I'm like, you have no idea what you're about to do. <laughs> it's completely different. Mm. Um, so it feels way different. It's very different on your system. Um, and so when that happens, for most people, like I'll just explain one of my series. So I do eye masks, so I don't watch a video. I did watch a video at the beginning, um, but I do an eye mask now. And I feel like I'm on a roller coaster. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm on this kind of roller coaster. It's very wave like. So it'll go through intensity and then kind of fall in intensity. And for me, I'm, on, I'm literally on a roller coaster. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, like almost like you're at a ride in an amusement park, like in one of the buildings, you know, and you're kind of going through and seeing the different scenes. Wow. And so that's what mine does. Mine like goes through these scenes and it'll be this one color and then it'll mesh into a different color. And, oh, then, cool. and so for me, different things will come up depending on what, uh, what it, what my intention was coming in. Um, some people, when they go into dissociation, they see a portal or they see wow. like a, whirlpool you know they actually see something that they're supposed to go into and especially people who are struggling with anxiety that elicits a lot of fear mm. <laughs> because that one of the greatest teachers if not the greatest teacher of the ketamine psychedelic experience is the act of surrender mm -hmm. and that is a huge teacher for us especially if you're an anxiety driven person who those people tend to be into control, controlling your environment, controlling what's happening, controlling your life, controlling this. And the idea that you're going to fall into something or go into something 
feels terrifying. They feel like they're going to die. Like, what's going to happen? I'm going to fall in there and I'm going to die. That's, mm -hmm. in the end, most people's biggest fear, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And that's what comes up for people. What most people realize in that moment when they finally are able to let go is actually everything is the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah, know, that we don't huge. really... There's not really a difference. There's not really a difference and that you can trust the universe and you can plunge wow. and you can let go. And in the end, you're not actually in control anyway. It's all mm -hmm. an illusion. You're making this up. Mm -hmm. You're making all of this up and you're creating this, you're creating suffering from yourself by your sense of control and identity and what you're holding on to. And, and so, it looks different for a lot of people. Some people have a lot of visuals. I have a client <laughs> who's a friend and she always has like three shaman women. Awesome. And they're, she's like in this like wow. teepee tent thing and they do drumming and wow. she has like very crazy, and I'm like, I want your I want that. I want the TV. <laughs> I was like, that one's The roller coaster awesome. sounds pretty awesome. The though. roller coaster is good. But like Ken doesn't get any visuals. His is like not visual at all. And with his, with anxiety, mm -hmm. d d has he had those experiences where it's like, oh my gosh, something so scary uh, is going to happen. Oh. And then learning <laughs> to let go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Ken's story is hilarious because he is a control freak. He's an anesthesiologist. He's supposed to be in control. His yeah. whole life is about controlling shit. <laughs> right. Um, but it causes a lot of suffering in his right. life and has for decades. Um, and so up until his fourth, I think it was his fourth or his fifth infusion, he saw this it was a whirlpool for him. Oh, wow. And he would force his way out of it. So oh. he would go and go around it. And then if he, you hyper focus, you can bring yourself out right. of it at right. some point. Wow. And he, he likes to watch the TV. And what he would do was focus on the TV really hard. And it would pull him back wow. into his body. <laughs> and finally, he laughed at himself. was like, okay, why are we playing? Yeah. I'm playing a game. Wow. Like, why will I not let myself go? And... The decision we made with him, which we make with very few clients, but happens sometimes, is we gave him enough where he didn't have a choice. And so we just upped his dose for his next infusion yeah. because there's a point in which you yeah. can't fight it. Right. You, will, you are going. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you are not along for I the ride. I have experienced that in other psychedelic drugs, <laughs> yeah. depending on the there's, dose. Yeah, yeah, there's just not an option. Mm -hmm. And we only, of course, do that with people who have a really strong ego and are ready and are really willing to push themselves into that because again that's scary but then once you do it once for most people the fear yeah is significantly reduced i won't say he still gets nervous and i get a little nervous i get a little nervous every psychedelic for experience sure. because i respect for sure what's happening <laughs> for sure um and so we get a little nervous beforehand but um there's just been some really interesting I mean, it's just, it's just fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating even if you're not really struggling because that's the interesting mm -hmm. thing with me. I did it when I was probably at the best place I've ever been at. Like, I was in a really good space. I've struggled a ton in my life, but for the last few years, I've been doing really well. And so I was like, well, this will be interesting. What, <laughs> what happens when you're pre yeah. doing pretty well? And I did, uh, so I did my series about a like right after we opened about a year and a half ago. And, um, you know, I wasn't really sure. I was really interested in the exploration part because I was like, I love altered states. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this will be really fun. Like, let's see what my weird consciousness does. Yeah. Um, and then between infusion two and three, I cried for a whole week. Wow. And I was like, <laughs> well, I don't really like that part. But I also have done enough work to realize that is something that I really needed to do. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge emotional suppressor. That's always mm. in my issue. I suffer in silence. Mm. Nobody ever has ever known that anything was wrong with me mm. until I publicly came out probably four, four or five years ago about my issues. But no, wow. I was like the happiest depressed person anybody had ever known. Yeah. Wow. Um, but because of that, I've never allowed myself to, f I hate feeling bad emotions. So I just yep. trash. There's so many people who can relate to that. Yeah. I bet you're the only person like that. <laughs> yeah. Nobody else does that. <laughs> I'm very special. Um, and so I went through my whole series and at the end I was a little like, I'm not sure. 
not sure what happened. I don't know if it really, <laughs> I was like, it's weird we have this clinic and what if it doesn't really work? Yeah. And like, you know, it was just yeah. a lot of stuff came up and it took me about a month and I finally was like, and I kind of felt like, I would call it lazy afterward. Like I was like, I don't really, I feel like I lost my motivation. I was like, not really like, I'm like a gung ho crazy gym person. And I'm right. kind of like a get shit done person. Yeah. And it, kind of all that kind of like, you know, I'm like, what is happening? Yeah, <laughs> and wow. about a month later, I'd been doing some processing and integration work. And what I had figured out is my inner bitch had gone away. Wow. And I didn't even notice, but she had completely gone away. And she has been yelling at me for my entire life. And really, even Sorry. though I'd done a lot of work and she had gotten a lot kinder in the last few years, she wasn't quite as mm -hmm. mean as she used to be. She was still the thing that was ruling my life. She was the one, my unworthiness, who is that person who is speaking to me, was my, I had convinced myself that that was my intrinsic motivation. I wow. told myself that the reason I showed right. up and the reason I had to do everything was because, you know, it's because of her. It's because I wasn't good enough. I had to mm -hmm. prove myself to people. Mm -hmm. I had to be more than people. I had to work out harder than people. I had to, you know, have my shit together. And when she went away, it felt like I lost my edge. And it took me about four months to really realign and figure out if, if I'm not getting ruled by my unworthiness, where is that going to come from oh, again? Man. And it was this huge, like, it kind of shifted everything. But it mm. changed a lot of things. Like, I went off social media. Like, I stopped my personal brand. Like, because I just kind of shifted. And and it, I'm fundamentally different in a lot of ways. I'm so grounded now and I've never been grounded. I've always been oh. very flighty. I've always had FOMO. I've always had to do things until I was exhausted. And this is the first time in my life where I'm just like really chill. <laughs> wow. And it's really interesting. <laughs> it, to me, it sounds like you healed your heart. So like, like that groundedness, you know, can come from the stillness of being in your heart. But if your heart is broken and you're protecting it and avoiding it, I feel like at least I've observed those same patterns myself as that's when I go into flighty head space, oh, yeah. uh, dominate the world. And, and I think what you're sharing is so important because there's, um, I've talked to my coaching women about this a lot. Mm -hmm. So many of us are motivated by not enoughness oh, that yeah. we feel like if we give ourselves compassion, it's scary because that means I won't perform anymore. Yes. Then I'll become fat. I'll become Lazy. inefficient. <laughs> I'll become a loser. Yes. So I have to hold on to this inner bitch. I have to hold on to this dictator inside of me or I'll lose it all. Mm -hmm. You know, and like, so, and I, I believe, cause I've gone through a similar journey of self-compassion, having to go through that switch of now all my motivations are coming from a place of love for others, not needing their approval, Completely. love for self, not needing myself to be better to love myself. Right. It's yes. coming from that inside place of, of, of giving, like there's power coming from within. So I'm wondering if you could share like for people who are stuck in like, be hard on myself to drive myself, right? Mm -hmm. If I give myself even this ounce, like what, what has the result been now that you're in this place of like, not having to prove it? Like, how do you feel different on the daily? Oh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, well, first off, I was perpetually exhausted. Yeah. And I don't think I ever realized how exhausted I was. And I was coping in a lot of unhealthy ways to deal with the fact that I wasn't really being kind to myself or taking care of myself. So I used to drink significantly, not like an alcoholic, but I drank regularly. I used to smoke weed regularly. You know, I did a lot of escapism. Mm -hmm. I was a huge food addict. Um, and now, and I've, it's allowed me to not use those. Um, I don't use those anymore as kind of coping mechanisms because I don't feel like I need to, I need which is wow. really helpful. Um, and it's just, a, I just feel more like myself. Yeah. Interestingly, again, it's, and this is a thing that comes with any kind of internal transformation is it shifted a lot of relationships. And then you have to kind of rebuild this realization of like, 
I'm not that person anymore. And then, mm. you know, especially because I was, <laughs> I was kind of the party clown. And when I decided I didn't want to be that anymore, people didn't like that. Wow. Yeah. And I so had many a lot fear of that. mechanisms keeping you in that persona, right? Yeah. Like you really had to have that shift inside because look how it's like, oh, and then people won't like me or then like I'll lose oh, my and friends. That was 100% what happened. <laughs> wow. You know, like the reality was that was the truth. The truth wow. was I had created this persona so that people mm. liked me and I was out and about and I was this mm. person. And then when I decided I didn't want to be that, People internalize that. Certain people, not, of course, my closest friends, but certain right. people internalize that as, like, what happened to you? Like, you used to... I, I can't tell you in the last year, how, probably in the last two years, how many people have said to me, you used to be fun. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting, because I... So I knew, Ellie, like, I know this side of you that you're talking about, and as we were talking, I... True. Before we even got to this, I was thinking, I feel so much more like heart centeredness coming from you. Like I feel like so much genuine realness mm -hmm. coming from you. I was like, it's really beautiful. Like the oh. softness looks really good on you, Ellie. So oh, that's so beautiful yeah. to hear. And so, um, so many of us can relate to that. You're reminding me, I'm sure, I, I know you're a Joe Dispenza fan because you oh, yeah, so kind of dropped him. one of his lines earlier, but he says, and if you want to build a new personal a reality you have to build a new personality and you had to have the courage or actually did you have the courage or did it just happen after you started to have this release and you're crying for a week and your heart is being healed and you're letting it all out and mean bitch alley's going away yeah did you feel like you like kind of still had the choice to go back into like funny mm -hmm. life of the you were like i can't do that anymore no the thing was before ketamine it had already started like it had already started i'd already like way cut back on my partying and that kind of thing uh -huh. and so i had already started to make the transition and when ketamine happened what really happened with the ketamine shift was I didn't give a fuck anymore. I didn't, and I've always had that mentality about a lot of things, but I didn't care if people liked it. Yeah. Like, and right. that was kind of, I really became okay with like, I'm really happy with myself. Mm -hmm. And if that makes you uncomfortable, mm -hmm. I'm super, not Beautiful. sorry. Yeah. yeah. It's self-love. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's what self-love is. Unconditional. Self, I don't need it from other people. And you don't have to do a horse and pony show to get it yeah. because you already have it. So it's yeah. like, if that, I don't need anything from you. But if we get along together, well, that's awesome. I love that too. <laughs> but I don't need it from you. And I don't have to do a horse and pony exactly. show to earn it. Yeah. And it really, to be honest with you, it was the final push out of the wellness industry because I can't, wow. I couldn't play with that anymore. Like I couldn't play with the aesthetic base. Yeah. Yeah. wellness what I view as complete and utter bullshit side of wellness anymore and I had started to move away from it anyway and when that happened I was like you know what I gotta mm. I've I've been moving in this path anyway and mm -hmm. I think I'm ready to kind of let that go and I stopped train I stopped training clients and I stopped doing mm. like wellness coaching and I was like you know I'm gonna just mm -hmm. shift focus and then I'm gonna just say this because you're a girl and you're completely get this the <laughs> the practical thing that happened which I view as a mirror and I still say if I could just market this side of ketamine, we would make a million dollars, is I have bought a swimsuit now for two seasons with zero body judgment. Beautiful. It really yeah. was like one Your of those things. Like I put still, it in, I put a swimsuit on and I legitimately said, it's so weird they cut this swimsuit weird. <laughs> That's so awesome. And I was like, and I like looked at my, because I've been so obsessed with my body that. for so long that it was always like, you know, it's a thing that we do. It's annoying. Mm -hmm. But, like, especially if you've been in wellness and you only look at people's bodies for so long, it just ingrains into your brain. And so it was, like, this one thing where it was, like, I no longer have to punish myself at the gym. I don't have to punish myself with my food. I'm not mean to myself about yeah. stuff. And, like, I don't get... And it's made me and Ken's relationship better yeah. because used to be as my weight fluctuated our connection fluctuated because I would feel bad about myself mm. and I he right. wouldn't even know what was going on right. of course and then he would be like what's happening you know and then he's mm -hmm. taking it he's like did yeah. I do something and really it was 
I put on a pound. You know, like right. nothing happened. Right. <laughs> in the grand scheme. I'm but, just you know, not feeling good about myself right now. I feel right like now. shit right now and yeah. it's making me unable to mm. connect with you. And so it's really been a wow. great connection wow. for us. Yeah. I'm just hearing so much healing. Oh, yeah. Like it healed your heart. It healed Completely. your connection with yourself. It filled your cup. And I, I want to hit on that. I, I, I'm like, mm, synchronicities because like the conversation I had just before I came here, um, she was also talking about how she's totally appalled by like she can't even get on Instagram and used to be an, an influencer and like can't even do it because she's so turned off by that aesthetic mm -hmm. thing that's out there. And I was telling her, I was like, I know that too, because I, I don't post things because I need validation, but I do notice that if I do a workout video and I happen to be five pounds leaner at that time, I'll get tons of okay. positive feedback. Wow, you're looking amazing. And I'm like, actually, I think I'm looking a little lean right now. Like I'm doing some experimenting and I'd like, I don't even want to be that lean, but that's yeah. interesting that you guys are all congratulating me on like doing better in life. You know, it's an yeah. interesting thing to observe. And then if I'm a little bit heavier, I'll get, it's crickets. I won't get as much, you know, and I'm, we're talking going from 14% body fat to maybe 18% body fat. Yeah. And, and I, and I, because I've been in that road for a while, I can see how people can get trapped in that. And I was at first, I was like, okay, gotta like look like this to make it, you know? Yeah. And now it's almost like the opposite. Like I want to push the point of it's about having a healthy relationship with yourself. And like, I have muscly arms, but I don't even really want to have muscly arms. I just really like lifting weights. It's, yeah, and I, I actually had to get to the point where I was like, screw it. I don't care if I have big arms. I like doing this, you know, and so it comes from that place of internal. So anyway, thank you for like, being so vulnerable and sharing that because I know so many people can yeah. relate and it comes from a broken heart. Oh, completely. It's it's yeah. having that you're not that self love is not all the way there. And so it leads to all these crazy behaviors, relationship issues, because you aren't giving it to yourself and you need it from somewhere else. Oh yeah. It's just that external validation is just you mm -hmm. just when you don't have internal validation, mm -hmm. you just latch on to every little morsel. And I think actually to be honest with you, the thing that hurts me on like wellness social media is I see the hurt. Yeah. Like I actually right. don't see people. You're not congratulating I'm them. I'm not congratulating <laughs> them. I feel bad. Yeah. I feel mm -hmm. heartbroken that women think the only mm -hmm. way for them to be valid in the world is to totally. show their ass to men. Totally. That breaks me apart totally. that there's brands that use girls. Yeah to sell things with their asset. Yeah. Like it just, it's like, I want to grab all of I them see. and be like, please yes. don't do this. I we see. can do different things yeah. though. I see, I see unhealed wounds. You yes, know? I that's see, what yeah. I see. And I mm -hmm. want people, you know, I just, you know, and the filters and the this and the comparison and the, yeah. and I can see behind that. And it yeah. just breaks my heart that people feel I get it. <laughs> I get it and it makes me feel better. I love that. I love that you brought this up because it's kind of like another possibility to explore for ketamine too is like to having that self-compassion and that self-love because like man, after my divorce, I was so heartbroken. I had so many, like, I knew I was in like these, I felt like a freaking maniac. I was in these like patterns of like, I knew it wasn't healthy, but I didn't know how to get out of it at the oh, time. Like yeah. I was just like freak. Like I know I'm not doing well <laughs> right now, but I can't stop. I was like addicted to all of the behavior. It was because my heart was broken and I was yeah. looking for validation. So I love that you're bringing this up because it's like another possible way to reason to maybe explore uh, ketamine. I love, I love that you guys have these, that you have this clinic because it's a legal way for people to experience a lot of what I've experienced from the heart healing that I've had from my psychedelic journeys. Completely. And that's the really big thing for people. Um, psychedelics can be really scary and nervous for people. They're not legal. Right. You don't know what you're getting sometimes, who right. you even go to. Like if you're right. not plugged into an or a group, I mean, we're in, a, we're in multiple things where we know people that yeah. can offer stuff safely. But if you don't, how do you even do it? Right. And you know it's a thing. Um, but here, the great news is it's in your town. Yeah. It'll You'll be in and out in an hour and a half. It's super safe. You're monitored. Always go to some place that you're monitored. Um, you know, and yeah. it's a really easy way to kind of tip your toe in. And then if it feels like a good fit, then maybe you could explore, you know, a different mm -hmm. healing modality. And that's our goal here at Aluma. Uh, you know, we're, 
we're in a lot of contact with maps and our goal is to then bring in you know the next thing will be mdma for ptsd treatment and hopefully getting on the next um group that's going to do that well, and that's then exciting psilocybin yeah. will be down the road and so yeah. you know our long-term goal is to have kind of an alternative psychedelic mental health clinic that really wow. ha- offers you know a, a range of tools depending on what you're looking for because we need more tools our yeah. tools don't work right now yeah. for most people and so we're just looking for other options for healing and and it's a really it's a really good starter one yeah amazing thank you guys so we're again we're in austin texas yes. iluma i'll put all the links i'll put you know the address on here so yeah. you can find them and then are you guys on social media or we website are. or yeah at Aluma Clinic on Instagram and Facebook. Is it I two L's or two L's U M M A. Okay. So two L's, two M's. At Aluma Clinic mm-hmm. on uh, and then what's your website? Aluma, I L L U M M A dot com. All right. Thanks so much, Allie. Of course. This Thank you for awesome. having me.